In this video, I'm going to explain what some of the common findings on MRIs are, how to tell what they are, and how serious they are so that you can understand your report better and have a better understanding of what to do next. So let's start with the most common findings on MRIs. And first, let's just get some terminology underway. So your lumbar spine or your lower back has five vertebrae. They're labeled from L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, going from top to bottom. Then the discs that are between them or the joints that are between them, they're named L1-L2 or L4-L5, or the very bottom one is L5-S1, meaning the first sacral vertebrae. And so that's kind of the naming convention. It works the same way in the neck or the cervical spine. You have seven vertebrae uh, going from C1 to C7, and then the discs and joints are named, for example, C3, C4, or C5, C6. So that's the terminology. Next, we'll move on to degenerative changes in the spine. And these are the most common findings that you'll see on MRI reports, especially in people who are over the age of 40. But they start much earlier in life, as we'll show in just a few minutes here. But degenerative joint disease is where you have a wearing down of the facet joints, which are the little spots that you see on the arrow in the top picture. And they can start to lose space between them where the two facet joints start to smash together and that can cause some pain and irritation. But those are very common findings to see in people and largely you can do things with your positioning to help give more space in between those facet joints. Most of the time bending forwards or bending away from the affected side will open up the spaces in those affected facet joints whereas bending backwards or going towards the side that's affected will close down the facet joints or make the spaces narrower. Then degenerative disc disease is basically the same thing but with the discs between the vertebrae. And so you start to lose height in the discs between the vertebrae. And what that can do is it can actually jam the joints together. So often when you have one, you a lot of times have the other one as well. But it can also start to narrow the spaces where the nerves exit the spine, which are the little yellow things that you see in the pictures. And when that happens, it can start to send pain down into your leg or possibly numbness or tingling. And we'll get to a little bit more of that in a second, which is sometimes known as spinal stenosis. But then there's one other term that's used in regards to degenerative changes, and that is spondylosis. And spondylosis this isn't the right picture of it, but spondylosis is basically just another word for degenerative joint disease. So degenerative joint disease is another name for arthritis of the spine or spondylosis. Those can be kind of interchangeable. And we'll move down here to spondylolysis, which is very confusing because it sounds a lot like spondylosis. But uh, spondylysis, lysis means in Latin, cut. So it means that something is severed. And that means a fracture, usually in a part of the vertebrae called the pars interarticularis, where you see the red line there. And when that breaks off the front part, the body of the vertebrae can start to slide forward. And that sliding forward is sometimes known as a spondylolisthesis, another word that can be really confusing with spondylosis, spondylysis, and spondylolisthesis. But those are what all those terms mean. Now, just to give you an idea of how common these things are, disc degeneration, you can see, starts very, very early in life. This is a table from a 2015 study in American Journal of Neuroradiology. And you can see that disc degeneration starts even in your 20s, about 37% of people without pain have these findings. And everything on this chart is all in people who don't have any symptoms. But the disc degeneration starts very early in life. About a third of people have it in their 20s. About 50% of people have it in their 30s. And then much more people have it as you start going later into life. So not having disc degeneration on your MRI would actually be abnormal. 
Then you can see disc height loss is also fairly common. About a quarter of people in their 20s, a third of people in their 30s, half of people in their 40s and 50s, and so on and so forth have that. So again, another very common thing. Then facet joint degeneration or degenerative joint disease, as we saw, that's not so common in young people. But then as you start getting age 50 plus, that starts becoming very common. And that's largely a lot of the people that we see at More for Life in the clinic, as well as a lot of the audience on this channel. So that is very common in most of the people who we see in our clinic, as well as the people who watch this channel. Then spondylolisthesis is a forward slipping, and we'll get to that next. But you can start to see in the 70s and 80s and somewhat in the 60s, that becomes somewhat common as well. And again, in people without pain. So the take home point of this slide is that if you have some of these findings on your MRI, don't get worried because they're big words. They sound scary. They sound like they're probably not good things, but a lot of normal people without pain have them, which means if you have them and happen to have pain, you can get back to a state where you still have them, but don't have pain. So this is spondylolisthesis. And spondylolisthesis is a forward slipping of one vertebrae on another. And that's anterolisthesis. You can also get retrolisthesis, which is a backward slipping. But in this forward slipping, you can see it's graded from grades one to four, and then a grade five or spondyloptosis, which grades four and five are not good. If you have those, those actually are probably pretty big problems. But grades one and two, and to some extent three, but one and two for sure, if you see those on your MRI, don't get so worried. They're fairly common. And as long as you're not having a lot of symptoms going down into your legs and you can't correct that with positioning or with therapy, then don't get too worried if you have a grade one or grade two spondylolisthesis. Because as you can see, a lot of people in their 60s, about 25%, about half, a third of people in their 70s and half of people in their 80s have these, and those are people without pain. Now, retrolisthesis is just the opposite of that. You can see this at the bottom of this picture where L5 has started to slip backwards on S1. And again, don't get too worried if you have these things on your MRI um, because they're fairly common findings. Now, spondylitic versus degenerative spondylolisthesis. Spondylitic means if you have a spondylysis, which means that fracture in the vertebrae where things start to slip forwards. And degenerative means just the discs have dried up over time. So the segments in your spine become a little looser and it can cause things to slip around a little bit more. All that means is that because your discs aren't doing as good a job stabilizing or if you've had a fracture in your spine, your bones are no longer stabilizing the segment, you have to do a little better job with your core muscles and your abdominals to get stability that the passive structures, your bones and your discs are now lacking. But it doesn't mean in most cases that you can't go on and live a fairly normal, healthy life without being held back by pain. And again, seeing this uh, slide, I just pulled it up again to show that about 25% of people in their 60s and a third of people in their 70s and half of people in their 80s have that spondylolisthesis. Now, spinal stenosis means a narrowing of a space. That's what the word stenosis means, is it means narrowing. And you can get that in several different places, either in the central canal, which you can see on this next slide here, where the spinal cord runs, or you can get it on the peripheral nerves, either just outside the spinal cord, which is known as lateral recess stenosis, or in the spaces where the nerve roots exit the spine, which is known as foraminal stenosis. Now, that's not incredibly worrisome, especially if you're only having back pain and you're not having a loss of bowel or bladder function, or you're not having numbness or tingling or weakness in your legs. If you're having those things, those give a little bit more credence to the fact that you might need to look at this a little bit further. But certainly if you're just having back pain, don't get worried if you have some stenosis on your spine. Additionally, if you are having leg pain, 
most of the time with proper treatment, you can get that pain to come out of your leg and go back into your back, known as centralization, and not have to have a surgery. It's only when you have progressive muscle weakness in the leg where it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker over time, or that you've had a lot of treatment and you're not getting any stronger, you're still having weakness in your legs, or certainly if you're losing control of your bowel or bladder functions. Those would be more surgical indications. But if you happen to have some stenosis in your spine and you're just having back or buttock pain, probably not a really high risk for surgery at that point. And finally, the vertebral disc dysfunction. This is something that people get really worried about if they have a bulging disc or herniated disc or uh, disc extrusion is another word for it. But there's a different grading scale of this. I'll pull up a bigger picture here so you can see it. A bulge is basically where the disc just starts to bulge out some, but it doesn't really exceed its normal bounds by all that much. If you have a disc bulge, those are very common and most of the time they won't give you any sorts of problems. Now, if you start getting a protrusion, you can see the nuclear material, the dark blue part of the disc starts to bulge out a little bit more and it can start to go back into where the spinal cord runs. In most cases, those aren't gonna cause really severe problems, but then as you start getting further out into extrusion or extrusion with sequestration, that disc material can start to put pressure either on the nerve roots that go out into your legs or on the spinal cord itself. Now, they used to think that certain types of exercises and things centralized that disc material and made it go back in, but that doesn't really happen quite so much. Additionally, there's things like decompression therapy or spinal traction that are proposed to centralize that disc material. Most of the time, that doesn't happen. Your body can reabsorb that, but it can take a long time, a year to two years for your body to reabsorb it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have pain or inability to do things for that period of time. Again, you can have these things on your MRI and still not have any pain. As you can see, a disc bulge is very common, starting even as low as the 20s. About a third of people have it in their 20s. By the time you get up to 40s, about 50% of people have it, and then it gets much more common as you get older than that. So again, disc bulges, probably don't worry about it all that much. Disc protrusion is a little less common. About a third of people have them pretty much across the board, getting a little bit more than that as you start getting up into your 60s, 70s, and 80s. But for the most part, about a third of people, again, without any problems, have that. So don't get too worried by the findings of your MRI is probably the take home point. A lot of times you can avoid surgery by having the proper conservative treatment. And I'm not gonna go into that in this video because largely what you see on your MRI isn't gonna greatly affect the conservative approach for that. So for that, you do need an individualized evaluation by a physical therapist. And if you are in the St. Louis area, we'd be happy to help you out here at More For Life. If you're watching this from somewhere else, you can check out our other playlists for neck pain and back pain, which I'll link to in just a moment. But if you did find this video helpful to better understand your MRI and maybe be a little less worried about what you find, please hit the share button and share this with someone else who may need to hear this message. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.